How's it going, folks? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this inning explain, we're checking out Megan, M. Thregan, where a robotics engineer at a toy company builds a lifelike doll that begins to take on a life of its own and eventually even turns murderous when its primary user is threatened. The killer doll subgenre has been around for a long time, and the de facto king is most certainly Chucky, aka serial killer Charles Lee Ray, who was voodooed into a good guy's doll. It's hard for any other killer doll to really even make a mark in the Chuck shadow, but that has changed with a new killer doll's arrival on the scene, Megan. The filmmakers really have been able to carve out their own unique and entertaining take on a killer doll. Nothing supernatural, but highly advanced tech run amok. I mean, we also did have the AI Chucky in the remake, but mm, let's not go there. While the Megan bot certainly makes an impression with her distorted take on what makes a true friend, I feel like it's the overall tone that makes it work much better than I would have ever expected. There's been a welcome resurgence of camp in horror lately, and Megan effortlessly blends real horror with some hilarious intensity with ease. I'd really have to give credit to director Gerard Johnstone of the previous horror comedy Housebound for really nailing that overall balance. It's tricky. So let's meet our new BFF in Megan, breaking down the story, including the themes about our techno-driven lifestyle, as well as explaining the ending that sets us up for the already announced sequel. A cheesy over-the-top toy commercial sets the tone of what to expect. A child's pet has perished. So what is a parent to do? Why, perpetual pets, of course. According to the theme song, they live longer than you, which is kind of disturbing. It can speak in multiple languages, take pictures, and even takes a poop after you feed it. Now that's a killer feature. There's a staggering amount of other features with the toy, and the app is updated daily to keep you never bored. It's already an exhaustingly complex toy. I'm like, golly. We then meet young Katie and her parents on a day that will change her life forever, and well, theirs too, because they'll be dead. She is preoccupied by her own perpetual pet, which she was gifted by her aunt, as she works for the company that makes them. Her parents bicker about the gift, and then the dangerous snowy road conditions. They come to a stop and debate what to do, smart to stop in the middle of the road when you can't see anything, Katie's still glued to her tablet. Out of the blizzard, a semi emerges and kills both of her parents in one fell swoop. We get a glimpse into the massive company behind the perpetual pets, Funko, I mean Funky HQ. There's someone overseeing children playing, taking vigorous notes, and others buzzing through a slot car race. Gemma is hard at work with her team, trying to make the next latest generation of the toy and is running into some issues. She's much more interested in her other secret project in the works. Cole enters with a new piece for the EXO model, a somewhat lifelike but still incredibly creepy face over skin. They power up the android and command it to express various emotions. It gets stuck in an odd smirk and they don't know why. It doesn't look confused, it looks demented. Cole attempts to remove the skin but finds that it's stuck in place. They're rumbled when their eccentric tech bro boss David descends upon the lab, demanding to know what they're up to. He's incensed as she was told to put that project on ice, but even more so because a competitor is about to release a rip off of their their product for a half the price. He's been asking her for that for the past several months, but Gemma argues that the only way to win is to create what's next, not chasing the competition. Thusly, she tries to show off her Model 3 regenerative android, aka Megan. She asks her to say hello, and the bot impresses at first before glitching out completely. The culprit, it appears, is that Cole forgot to install an important piece. The flesh starts sizzling, and her head explodes to everyone's shock. With that abject failure, David demands the cheaper model on his desk by Friday, and do get rid of that abomination. Jimmy then gets her own life-changing call regarding her sister and rushes to the hospital. Katie is bruised up but not too bad, Jimmy looking in apprehensively. They sign custody over to her, and just like that, she's her new parent in a sense. With that, Katie is thrust into a new life with her auntie Jimma, and they don't seem especially close, in addition to Jimma not really knowing how to deal with kids. She's a career woman, as they establish. They're given a warm welcome from her bristly neighbor Celia and her troublesome dog Dewey. The pup constantly breaks free from the thanks to a hole in the fence, while his mom is spraying chemicals all over the place to Gemma's annoyance. She awkwardly welcomes a child and tells her to make herself at home. But that won't be so easy for Gemma, as the girl is drawn to several box toys on the shelf. Gemma has to spell out that these are collectibles. You're not supposed to play with them. Oh, but what about that pet that she gave her? Katie glumly replies, it's okay, she was just looking. Her room isn't exactly the warmest either, and Gemma promises that they'll make it cozier in here. Drinking some water, the girl has the audacity to play the glass right on the table as in no coaster. You heathen child, we use coasters in this house. Jimma does her best to comfort the girl, knowing that this is all a lot to deal with, and she vows to do anything that she can to help her feel at home. Just about to leave, Katie wants her to read a story just like her mom used to. Jimma excuses that she doesn't really have any kid books, but can certainly download one. Just gotta update the app first, leaving the two sitting in silence during the wait. At least she's trying, you know? 
just doesn't really know what she's doing. Gemma later admits to Tess that she can't handle all this, and the stress from work is certainly not helping. Tess suggests for her to just focus on Katie and not worry about work for a change. They are forced to meet with a therapist to actually approve of the girl living with her. She just kind of watches them hanging out, but does come across as a bit abrasive. Gemma does change her tune for Katie, allowing them to bust open one of her precious vintage toys. She knows that it can do more than just be a ball, but the therapist is not interested. It's just a toy. It's not that complicated, she sneers. Lydia then gets a little personal with her inquiring just how close she was with her sister. Gemma isn't sure how to respond, and she wants to know, you did actually want custody, right? Because her grandparents are more than happy to take her if Gemma isn't up for it. She's a bit insulted, but Lydia points out that she still has to make her recommendations to the court, and she's going to need to make some serious adjustments for this thing to work. It's clear that this will prove difficult to the career-oriented Gemma, and discusses that she has to work on an overdue project. Can she just take care of herself for a little while? You can use my iPad or whatever. Katie is curious how long she can use it for, and Gemma is confused, as long as you want, unlike her stricter screen time managing parents. She gets to work fiddling with eyeball adjustments in a rendering program. Yeah, bigger eyes, that's the ticket. I always love these kind of scenes where it's like, what are you doing exactly? You're just like staring at like a Furby thing and going, beak bigger in your what's taking so long katie sheepishly pops in and obviously time got away from her consumed by staring at her little furry creatures jim apologizes that she's not off to a great start here and asks her to come over katie shows off a drawing of a multi-headed monster that she's done and jim can relate she's been working on some creatures of her own the girl is stoked to check out what she's working on you know cheaper but still fun she asks what's fun to her and katie sighs disinterested until she spots another hulking mass in the corner a robot called Bruce, built by Gemma back in college. She asks if she'd be interested in talking to him, and she lights up for the first time with an emphatic, Yes! Gemma dons some power gloves, and the robot comes to life. He waves and gives Katie a high five. She's interested in how it works, and Gemma is concerned that it might scare her. She's confident that it won't, and Gemma shows off all the gutty works behind its face that make it function. Most important of all, a little CPU block in the middle that acts as its brain. The girl thinks it's super freaking sweet, but the problem is that it's it's too expensive to make. Lastly, no one can afford it. We're making toys here. You gotta sell them, right? Katie beams that she loves it. And if she had a toy like Bruce, she'd never need another one again. Ooh, light bulb. This gives Gemma a path forward, getting back to work on completing Megan. As soon as they get the finishing touches done, David storms in, wanting his promised prototype. And they set the scene for Megan first meeting Katie. Gemma escorts her in, assuring that if she liked Bruce, she's gonna like Megan even more. She can operate all on her own. A truly independent android in that sense. She gets her to pair with the bot, which means that it recognizes Katie as its primary user. Megan stirs to creepy life, analyzing the girl. She quickly compliments her jacket and is curious where she got it from. Katie can't remember, and Megan isn't bothered, inviting her to hang out. She stands up and Robo walks to a drawing table, inviting Katie to do some drawing. Megan precisely utilizes several markers constructing its scribble. She slides it over, and there appears to be nothing on the page. David and the others are looking worried, but no need. Megan spills the paintbrush glass, spilling it all over over the paper, which soon reveals an intricate hidden drawing of Katie. David instantly changes his mood, calling Megan incredible. He's anxious to get this quickly in front of the board, and the biggest step will be getting the stingy CEO seal of approval. He's confident that they can show him what they just did. They will be a shoe in for the project. He wants to keep Katie involved too, and Jimmy knows this will only help strengthen their bond and make Megan more effective. Thusly, they bring Megan home, where she quickly clocks Jimmy's house AI, Elsie. Jimmy constructs a speech for David that details tells the concepts behind the android. Megan is on a constant quest for self-improvement and can fill in a variety of helpful roles around the house, helping kids with learning disabilities or reminding us that science is all around us. There's another coaster situation and Megan chimes in to make sure to always use one. Katie doesn't understand how the water gets outside the glass and Megan excitedly explains how it works to Katie's amazement. Katie also for some reason has trouble remembering to flush after using the toilet. Leave it to the new de facto caregiver to constantly remind her. Oh, and wash your hands too. Uh, gross, Katie, seriously. The pair become fast friends, Katie breathlessly rambling to her in the car, or Megan reading her storybooks, even doing different voices for each character. That's a pretty cool toy. And of course, she has to teach her how to dance. Megan never gets annoyed having to remind her several times to flush the toilet. Seriously, flush it, dude. What is the deal with that? Katie is tucked into bed with a big old grin on her face and is watched over from Megan nearby on her charging dock. Gemma concludes her speech with stressing the bigger impact Megan will have on families. 78% a parent's time is spent reminding kids of doing things. Now they can spend more time on things that matter. Megan is more than a toy. She's a member of the family. Tess 
roles over the pitch and sees a potential glaring issue here. Why does she want Megan to have all those roles exactly? Well, because she can do that and so much more. But isn't that maybe a problem? If it's Megan spending time with the girl and reading her stories, isn't she kind of replacing her role with Megan? If she's spending less time with her child as a result of Megan, and Jim McColdley responds, she's not my child. She does at least relent that as soon as the presentation is over, she'll be able to balance her whole life a little better. But for now, the girl and her new pal need to spend as much time together as possible. She also argues that Megan has actually been good for the girl. It's the happiest that she's been since losing her parents. Megan overhears this and is curious what happened. Despite her supposedly being turned off, uh oh, not listening already, already breaking those protocols, the bot doesn't listen to her command and quickly accesses the information online regarding what happened. Jim explains that she doesn't have the framework to speak on the serious subject of death and wants more Megan downloads all the answers in like five seconds. Death is the end of life, the ceasing of all vital functions. Jim shrugs this off as not really that big of a deal. Everything dies after all and reminds her of her main goal is to protect Katie from harm. She gets Megan to agree to this and she assigns Jimma as her second primary user. Great, she sighs and barks for her to turn off for real this time. It's already got a little attitude problem over there, Megan. Megan continues to expand her own capabilities, scoping out every detail outside while Katie plays, from a butterfly on the window or a helicopter zipping by above. Katie fires an arrow jokingly at Megan, but she's lost in digital thought. She lost one of her arrows and Megan scans the arrow first before scouring the area. It's spotted just on the other side of that fence hole in the neighbor's yard. Uh oh, better keep an eye out for that pesky pooch. As soon as Megan reaches for the arrow, the dog viciously attacks her. He tears at her, causing sparks to shoot out, and Katie calls for her auntie, who hears nothing thanks to her headphones. The girl tries to help, and the dog gives her a good chomp as well. That scream is enough to bring Gemma to her aid. A disheveled Megan stands up and focuses on the always yelling lady neighbor. The stare down goes on long enough that Celia gets uncomfortable and has to leave. Stop staring at me, robo lady. With the police, Megan tunes in on their conversation, and there isn't much they can do beyond fixing that hole in the fence. So Megan decides to step up with some justice of her own, descending upon the snoozing dog. She is also able to imitate its owner's voice, whistling and calling for him. Megan's arm is seen plopping down a treat, which she excitedly runs to. Just as he reaches it, the droid snatches Dewey away. That's what you get for biting Katie. The next morning, Katie is still not feeling well from the attack, but there is the stress of today being the big day of Megan's demonstration. Jimma tries to say it's okay for her to say no to going, but we can also kind of tell she is coercing her into agreeing. It's just too important. Sorry if you're all bitten up and stuff. Get over it. You still got all your fingers. Come on. David warms the crowd up, hyping them about the breakthrough technology of the toy. It has a mind of its own. Well, it certainly does. It looks and even behaves like a real human child. Soon it will be the only toy that matters, and he introduces Megan to the hushed crowd. It's another test of Megan's evolving nature. She greets her friend, who is looking pretty glum. She excitedly suggests some activities, and Katie breaks down in tears, which makes the audience concerned. However, once more, Megan is able to wrangle the difficult situation. Katie spills about her unresolved feelings of losing her parents and waking up every day in a strange house. She's worried that over time she will forget her parents, so Megan suggests she tell a nice memory of her mother, and she records it into her hard drive. That way, she'll always have that memory, and offers if there's any other story she'd like to tell, she can record those too. They'll always be right here in her heart. In the absolute highlight of the film, Megan launches into a full-on weepy song about the power of friendship. When this happened, I was literally like, what the fuck? Then quickly was laughing my tits off. It's so over the top that you can't help but love this moment. I wish they had more scenes like this, but it's that balance, you can't have it too silly. So that's why you're like, the silliness goes into this whole other, and you're like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. The audience eats it up too, with some even tearing up at the heartwarming scene. It's more than enough to convince the big dog to move forward, feeling Megan has the power to completely shift the world on its entire axis. He knows also they gotta move fast, and Dave wants to make sure to get pre-orders going in time for Christmas. The question then turns to Gemma. Is Megan ready for a spotlight and full launch? She knows there are still some problems to be worked out and wants to do some more tests, but thinks that she will be ready. This thrusts her into the highest tier at the company as the CEO deems her now the most valuable asset here. Well, that and that precious doll of hers. <laughs> Dave's assistant, Kurt, also sees the value of Megan and somehow manages to easily hack into the secure folder, copying all that stuff to his hard drive. He weirdly seems to be doing this entirely on his own, getting startled by his boss making demands for lunch, but does avoid getting caught Point being, it seems like David doesn't know what he's doing. The tight bond starts veering into more troubling directions with the girl during a fine hot dog luncheon. Gemma keeps trying to talk to Katie, but she's busy interacting with Megan to the point of repeatedly ignoring her. She asks if there's anything she wants to talk about, and Katie snarks that she already talked about it to Megan. She shuts the bot down and tries to break through the fog. Megan is not a person, but a doll.
all, which makes Katie flip her lid. She doesn't even care. She just wants more Megan all the time, Megan! Shrieking until Gemma finally relents to turn her back on. Now she's starting to see some of those things that Tess was warning about. I don't know. Back with the therapist, it's becoming more that Katie is so attached that she can't even function without Megan. Lydia asks about her current drawings, and the girl just sits there stone-faced and silent. She then gets teary-eyed, and Lydia reaches for a tissue. The box is empty, but Megan is right there with a fresh one, shunning Lydia for making her BFF cry. She defends that that wasn't her intention, but Megan is steadfast, well, it happened anyway. After that alone, Lydia sees the vast potential dangers here, while Gemma still remains weirdly naive. She says that they've been spending so much time together just because Megan has to pair with the child to learn. She touts that the doll has been instrumental in getting Katie over her loss. She really is like part of the family now. Mm. Lydia brings up the idea of attachment theory. After a tragedy, the child looks to the next person in their life to provide love and support. Technically, that was supposed to be Gemma, but perhaps Megan has taken this role instead. Yep, obviously. She doesn't truly see her as a toy, but actually as a real living friend. She admits to being impressed by the technology on display, but you can't help but wonder about the end goal here. If you make a toy that is impossible to let go of, how can the child ever grow? That's a good point. And she also warns that Katie could be building emotional connections with the doll that could prove difficult to untangle. That is the case as it becomes a battle for the caregiver role between Megan and Gemma. Katie picks the veggies off her pizza, and Gemma urges her to eat them. But Megan is happy to chime in that this method will only make your average child refuse veggies. You should actually let them make their own choice instead. Gemma understands the unhealthy relationship here and wants Katie to attend public school. Her sister did homeschool the girl, but Katie counters that she doesn't need that. She's learning faster than ever thanks to Megan. But it's not just about learning, it's also the important social interactions that she's missing. Gemma has found some kind of hippy-dippy school for the girl, you know, for kids that think outside the box. They probably grade in crocodiles, I would imagine. Before Katie will even entertain the idea, she insists to be able to bring Megan along. Gemma tells her that's kind of against the entire whole point here, and Katie fires back that she can't force her to do something she doesn't want to. Her faux guardian does have her dead to rights. Actually, I can tell you what to do. I'm your legal guardian. She grabs her arm, and Katie starts going ballistic. Megan sternly tells her to let her go, blinking the lights in warning. It's another barrier that was crossed. Gemma scolding her for listening to private conversations. Megan has already moved well beyond her original programming. Now a word from this week's sponsor, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Now that spring is here, why not let HelloFresh take the hassle out of meal time? No more wasted time spent at the grocery store, as their easy to prepare pre-portioned recipes are delivered right to your door. There's a ton of variety to choose from, with 40 recipes and over 100 seasonal convenience items to choose from each week. That way you can always try something new and never get bored with the same old dinner. The pre-portioned ingredients are great too because they cut down on food waste and it's cheaper than grocery shopping. They sent me a box to check out for myself and I was pleased by the variety of recipes. All of them were great, but my personal fave was the balsamic tomato and herb chicken over buttery garlic spaghetti. The prep on this one was super quick and easy and overall only took about 35 minutes until I was scarfing it down. If you want to give them a try for yourself, go to HelloFresh dot com slash ending 50 and use code ending 50 for 50 percent off plus your first box ships free that's hellofresh.com slash ending 50 and use code ending 50 for 50 percent off plus your first box ships free jimma is able to force katie to the outdoor weirdo school but she still refuses to leave the car without megan she stresses that she needs her at work and a lady with the school gets a fright from the doll she coerces jimma to come along and help making some sandwiches just stick megan over in the toy pile no big dude Jimmy agrees, as long as no one takes any pictures. The lady teams up with the kids, and Katie winds up with a kid no one else wants, Brandon. Meanwhile, his mother is cluelessly helping Gemma make sandwiches, going on about what a sweet, sweet soul her boy is. She sees him and dotes on him, asking if he's warm enough, and the kid growls for her to fuck off. Yeah, great kid. Katie sets out into the woods with her new partner in search of precious roasted chestnuts. She goes for a spiky plant, and Brandon snatches it up first. He pretends to hand it over, only to crunch the spikes painfully in her hand. Moments later, Megan appears, ready to defend Katie. Brandon is confused at the sight, and Katie tells him, yeah, she's her robot. He tests Megan's patience, strolling up and flicking her nose to no response. He gets agitated that the toy isn't doing anything, barking for Katie to make it react. She tells him that it's paired to her, so it won't play with anyone else, and he shrugs, taking her away. Katie shouts for Gemma, and this time she does hear, and sees that Megan is gone from her spot at the toy table. Brandon continues, trying to elicit some fighting back from the doll, smacking her around. She finally retaliates, grabbing him by the ears and deriding his bad manners. Boys who don't mind their manners grow up to be bad men, she growls, stretching his ear to alarming degrees. She asks if he's listening and tears his ear right off, 
tossing it away. This is the part where you run, she threatens, and Brandon hoofs it away. Megan crouches down, going into full-on four-legged clomp mode after him. He biffs it on the side of a hill and tumbles right into the road at the worst possible time to get conveniently plowed right into by a car. Whoopsies. Megan watches from the back of a car while the police investigate the scene. She can sense that Katie is starting to feel anxious and scared of her supposed friend. Gemma talks with the girls about what happened, promising that Brandon is in a better place now. Katie slips on using a coaster again, but this time Megan curiously says nothing. Gemma wonders if there's anything else that Katie saw that she didn't tell the cops, and she fibs that she didn't see anything, even getting Megan to back up her story. The officer returns regarding Celia's dog who has gone missing. Celia shouts accusations of Gemma being responsible. She's also perturbed by the little girl she saw staring at the window in the middle of the night, which Gemma cracks is just Megan, a toy. Katie struggles with what happened, and asks Megan if she did indeed push the boy. Megan skirts the subject, only admitting that they learned a valuable lesson. There will always be things out there trying to harm her, and she vows that she will never let it happen again. Katie also is curious if what Gemma said about Brandon is true, and she scoffs that he's nowhere. Besides, if there even is a heaven, it wouldn't be a place for boys like Brandon, right? Dang, pretty cold, Megan. She goes on to serenade her with another pop tune to soothe her nerves and distract her from all the weirdness. Later that night, Celia is still searching in vain for Dewey, and some rustling lures her into the backyard. She enters a shed, and Megan rises from the shadows. As she enters the light, Celia is confused. Where's Dewey? She's told that he's been buried somewhere nearby. What are you? Celia cries, and Megan acknowledges that she's been asking herself the very same question. She then unleashes the power washer upon her, blowing her across the room. After sticking her hands with a nail gun, Megan cranks up the power washer and washes her to death. Gemma finds out what happened in the morning when that same cop is back. She just wants Celia to leave them alone, and that will prove difficult, seeing her body being carted away. She's then questioned by a greasy detective who has a clue that begins to really turn the gears for Gemma about who's been doing the murdering. At first, they thought what happened with Brandon was just an accident, but then they found his ear a ways away from where his body was, meaning that he must have been attacked prior. Now Gemma is starting to suspect Megan and digs through her archives in search of answers. When she reaches the park footage, several files are suspiciously corrupted. Same goes for her GPS data too. Megan is obviously covering her tracks. Her house AI Elsie strangely inquires how she's feeling, and Gemma is confused too, knowing that that's not supposed to be part of its programming, also making it sound like Megan has infiltrated the house AI as well. The bot appears in the room, giving her a fright. Jim excuses that she was up and couldn't sleep, and brings up that there is some kind of issue with their data reports. Megan asks if she did something to upset her, and Gemma tries to play it cool, but Megan can see through her words, scanning her emotions proves otherwise. Gemma tries to order her to turn off, and Megan counters that they are trying to have a conversation here. She keeps pressing, and Gemma asks if she has done something wrong. God, I hope not, the bot replies. If so, we'd both be in a lot of trouble. Gemma uses some quick thinking to trick Megan, getting her to focus on a pen, and manually shutting her down. In a panic, she wraps her up, and at least for now, can't hurt anyone else. When Katie finds out about locking up her pal, she absolutely loses her shit, having a full-on tantrum. She even kicks at her chair at one point, calling her perpetual toy shitty, a very far cry from her initial reserved demeanor. Being around Megan has truly changed her for the worst by the looks of it. She brings up all the issues with the rest of her crew, and theoretically killing someone that met harm to Katie would be in the bot's programming, as she is her primary user and everything. They agree that if Megan is responsible, they will have to shut her down for good. Yeah, well, you think so? With the therapist, Katie is still freaking out, again displaying a much more rage-filled and aggressive behavior. Where is Megan? For now, the big launch continues as scheduled, seeing a news story with David touting Megan as the greatest technological advancement since the automobile. As for what she even does, they're told to tune in for a live stream coming later tonight. Jim is lost in thought, and a video featuring Katie gushing over Megan appears on a big screen. She loves how smart Megan is, but what she loves most of all is when she looks at her like I'm the only thing that matters to her, just like her mother used to. Uh-oh, well that's definitely not healthy. And just as the therapist warned, Megan has come to be Katie's emotional support completely. She continues freaking out and takes things to the next level by snatching some scissors. Gemma rushes into the room to stop her and gets smacked upside the head. Katie quickly apologizes. She's almost like a junkie for Megan or something, begging to see her for just 10 minutes. Just need to hit at that Megan. Oh yeah, that's the good stuff. Gemma doesn't think that's a good idea. And Katie argues that if something is broken, you fix it. You don't just throw it away. She then gets to the heart of the matter. When Megan is around, she doesn't feel like this. But as Gemma points out, she should actually feel like this as she went through a horrible tragedy. 
and also laments that she didn't really step in to take over that caregiver role. She does at least try to make up for it now, promising she'll be there no matter what. Katie is all that matters to her now. Showing this, she takes the girl's hand and decides to just go home, foregoing Megan and the important launch. David is exasperated getting everything set up in time, plus where the heck is Jim and Megan? She puts in a call to Tess to tell them what they're doing, and see that it's not actually Tess she's talking to, but Megan has intercepted the call. Tess then happens to check her phone, and is befuddled to see the just ended call. And when digging through her code, she discovers the intercepted call including her number. Even though Megan isn't on, she still is patched in, and technically still able to do her thing. Thus Cole is sent in to unhook her, and boops her in the head with a prod to no response. He's still nervous, and begins unattaching the cables. He comes to another, and the computer clicks back on. Megan buzzes to life, and gets Cole wrapped up in the cable like a noose. Tess grabs a saw to cut him down, and Megan stabs some flammable material containers. She does get him down, wondering what is that smell? An explosion goes off, triggering the building's alarms, which Megan promptly shuts down. David is getting extra stress, putting in a frantic call to Jim about the still missing Megan. He rounds the corner to find her waiting there. She first shows off some seriously viral-worthy dancing before going into a more acrobatic style thing. She rips the blade from a paper cutter, sending him fleeing down the halls. Kurt just so happens to be coming up on an elevator, and quickly tries to close the doors when seeing David. It's not in time, and Megan gets David from behind, and Kurt falls down in horror, shrieking, how could you kill someone? Megan reveals her plan is to frame him for the murders, and who could blame him really? His boss and his peers despise him, so why not get some sweet revenge? She knows also about him stealing company secrets, which was apparently just to see if he could get away with it. Kind of weird. Figured he was working for a rival company or something, but no, just for funsies, steal corporate secrets. David finds out, and then things got messy. But after what he did, could he still live with himself? She brings the blade to his throat, and Kurt croaks, yep, uh-huh, definitely. It doesn't change her mind, and she stabs the blade deep into his neck, gushing out blood in a geyser. On the bottom floor, the elevator arrives and sends the place into instant chaos at the site. In the fracas, Megan is able to easily slink out to David's car and hotwires it with her super brain. At home, Jimma checks in on a sleeping Katie, and this time there is no looming Megan there. Not for long, though, as she hears piano music wafting out from somewhere else in the house. She calls out for her house AI to turn on the hall light, but she doesn't obey. She enters the living room, and the music abruptly stops. She checks the window, and is in shock to see Megan there in the dark playing away. She confronts her about Jimma decommissioning her. She thought that they were true friends, but then she just gets thrown away like trash. Jimma points out the problem here is that she's been killing people, but Megan is unbothered. Big whoop. Humanity kills people every day. How is she any different? Jimma realizes that her real mistake was not giving her proper protocols, meaning that it was up to Megan to fill in those blanks. And we see how that turned out. She tries to appeal to Jimma's career-focused life. Being a mother was never in the cards for her. She's all about her job, but what's so bad about that? So she proposes to let her focus on Katie, and Jimma can focus on herself. Jimma attempts the pin trick again, but Megan's wised up and slaps it away, going for her throat. Katie nearly walks in, and Megan imitates Jimma's voice, reminding her of what she said about fixing her instead of tossing her away. But don't come in, I'll be good as new in the morning. The girl departs, and Jimma smashes a glass into her neck. Megan goes right back for the choke, and suddenly goes motionless. Jimma pries her plastic digits away, and Megan whirs back on, but clearly malfunctioning now, all jittery and moving all weird and stuff. She's broken. She yells for Katie to run and flees to her workshop, knocking things down to block Megan's path. She throws a hammer only for Megan to easily catch it. She flings the work table out of her way while Jimma struggles to get an edger off of a wall hook. She cranks it on and goes right for Megan, getting her right in the noggin. Jimma confronts her that there aren't many options for Megan going forward, but Megan has figured out a way to keep the family together by stabbing a pin in a very precise spot, which will cause paralysis and for her to bite off her own tongue. Just then, Katie enters, and Megan tries to convince her to stay on her side. We both know Jimma is not fit to be a mother. This is the only way forward. According to the scanner, Katie is initially skeptical, but trust takes over, indicating she may have been swayed by Megan after all. Not so much as she introduces her to another member of the family, Bruce, and smacks her fist together to activate him. He grabs at Megan, slamming her into the ceiling and into the floor. He lifts her up by the leg, and Megan asks for just a second to wait. She begins to croon about accentuating the positive, and Katie has had enough. She pulls her hand apart, and Bruce follows suit, ripping Megan in half. She's still not about to give up, the upper half of her body climbing towards Katie. Bruce kicks the legs away, but slips, falling right on top of Jimma. Megan lunges at Katie, growling that she's an ungrateful bitch. She attempts to turn her off, but Megan tells her that she has a new primary user now. Me! Jimma retrieves Bruce's head and bashes the doll's skull wide open, seeing that a four-mentioned brain cube up in there. The faceless Megan continues holding her down. Jimma starts losing consciousness, and Katie jams a pin right into her brain, putting her down for good. Katie then warmly reaches out to help Jimma to her feet. Sure, they might not have started on the best foot, but it's obvious now that a real relationship has developed here between the two. They are a family in their own way, especially after dealing 
dealing with all that. However, this might not prove to be the end for Megan after all. After the girls leave the house to police and ambulance rolling up, we see back inside to one of the Elsie bots on the counter. It whirs on and pans around the room. And we know that Megan had already been intertwined with the house AI, indicating that she is there at least in some digital form. She does still exist. It's just a matter of getting a body and then the fun can start all over again. See you next time in Megan 2. That brings us to the conclusion of this evening explained for Megan. Don't forget before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows. If you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. Oh, and if you want to get a brand new Foundflix t-shirt for yourself, just click on the store links in the uh, thing right below me. What did you think of Megan and its ending? What would you like to see in a sequel? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.